So I'd love to introduce our present presenter tonight, uh, Elise Moore. Elise teaches historical hearth cooking and food history at Historic Deerfield Museum. She has a BA in history from Mount Holyoke College and a diplôme culinaire from the New England Culinary Institute. Ms. Moore writes about historical perspectives on community food security and their intersection with women's history. Her writing on food topics has appeared in the Hampshire Gazette and the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery. So welcome, Elise, thank you. Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much to Wisteria Hearst for uh, hosting me this evening and to everyone else for um, attending tonight's talk. Uh, tonight, I will talk about women's labor in the food production, provisioning, sales, and service trades in some of the cities and towns along the Connecticut River during the 18th uh, through the 20th century. Labor that women performed here uh, during the early development of the Western Massachusetts wage-based economy was a time of transition when the value of barter was certainly still recognized. A look at the documented history of some of these women and their labor uh, complements the larger story of women's work in the textile and paper factory settings during the industrial development more commonly addressed in the scholarship of uh, Connecticut Valley women's labor history. And yet it is certainly connected to that story. Before the industrial period of the mid 19th century, most women worked in the home. By 1840, it is estimated that only 10% of women worked outside the home, and by 1850 had it increased to 15%. Treasury Secretary and economist Janet Yellen said in a recent address about the importance of women's labor history, and I quote, most women in the United States did not work outside the home, and those who did were primarily young and unmarried. In the early 20th century, just 20% of all women were gainful workers, as the Census Bureau then categorized the labor force participation outside the home. And only 5% of, of those married were categorized as such. Of course, these statistics somewhat understate the contributions of married women to the economy beyond housekeeping and child rearing, she said since women's work in the home often included work in family businesses and the home production of goods such as agricultural products for sale. And Yellen is not the first to recognize the understated or invisible contributions of married and widowed women whose work was often balanced with a rigid and demanding housekeeping and child rearing schedule. In her recent book on 18th century women's labor and livelihood in the middle Connecticut River Valley town of Hadley, Marla Miller points out that women's contributions to their family's incomes, sometimes in partnership with a husband and sometimes in widowhood, helped to preserve the value and experience of even as the mid to late 19th century cult of domesticity drove women into homemaking to the exclusion of wage earning, the opportunity to pursue entrepreneurship in the food trades was often accompanied by the skill, strength, ingenuity, and perseverance that helped to build a foundation for future generations. Because like other trades more commonly associated with male labor, such as timber cutting or joinery and cabinet making, stone cutting, carving and masonry, food trades such as inn and tavern keeping, bakeries, confectioners, and farming were often also passed down through families from generation to generation, building reputations and credibility for successive generations of women. So as we take a look at some uh, individual cases of women whose work interests and advances in the food trades, services, education, and written publication populated 
rural and urban Western Massachusetts, and in a couple of instances, a little beyond Western Mass, uh, we get a glimpse of the economic landscape that preceded what the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls the rapid rise in women's labor force participation. I'd like to begin by revisiting Janet Yellen's observation that women's work in the home often included work in family businesses and the home production of goods such as agricultural, wait, there we go, uh, agricultural products for sale, sorry about that. Um, often these home-based businesses complemented that of other household members whose work took them out of the home. So women needed to balance housekeeping responsibilities with income producing work, such as home production of goods to support the family. This experience was especially true for family members whose crops and products created either a source of cash income or a medium of barter. Dairy labor and the production of butter and cheese often fell to women in the rural agricultural Connecticut Valley farmland. Freshened cows, cows who had recently given birth, typically produced milk in a season from March to November. And until 1860, when the refrigerated rail car was introduced, the tendency of milk to spoil limited the extent of markets for milk to just a few miles from a given dairy. In order to delay spoilage, milk was converted into butter and cheese. According to Marla Miller, in her recent publication concerning women's labor in Hadley. <clears throat> the 18th century, in the late 18th century, the cheese making operation uh, at the Porter Phelps family's 40 acre farm in that town was overseen by Elizabeth Porter Phelps, whose herd of 13 cows, a large herd, a large herd for its day, could, could produce uh, nearly 600 pounds of cheese in seasons of good production, which sold for seven shillings and two pence a pound in the Boston market of the period, less a 5% commission for the factor or middleman who was hired to deliver the cheeses to market. Cheese could be and often was also exchanged for goods and services in the local neighborhood or town or was brought to a local shopkeeper for transportation to distant markets. The area of the farm that was used for cheese making operations is still part of the existing structure that has been preserved at the Porter Phelps Huntington Museum about two miles north of the Hadley Town Common. In Deerfield, <clears throat> two women in the Sanderson family of South Deerfield kept journals in the third quarter of the 19th century that made regular references to butter and cheese making using a box churn like the one pictured here, making several pounds of butter in each batch. The Sanderson uh, women's journals were written on alternating open pages of a sturdy leather bound account book of previous generations of Sanderson families, agricultural and building enterprises from the early 1800s. Although not as detailed as the accounts of Elizabeth Porter Phelps in her journal, their journal dis narratives uh, describe in short passages the regular and sometimes daily dairying and baking and sewing and childcare responsibilities that help to flesh out the generational farm labor history of the Sanderson family in the town of South Deerfield. Their journal entries always started with a weather report. January 23rd, pleasant but colder. First thing after breakfast, worked over some butter, then turned the cheeses, then got dinner. February 3rd, Susie churned two boxes of butter. Mother worked them over. February 4th, mother worked over the butter. February 11th, mother worked over a box of butter and some for ourselves. Commenced baking mince pies about half past nine and did not finish till half past three baked 21 in all. January 1st in 1876 uh, in another part of the journal, Laura and I worked two boxes of butter. Nowhere in the journal entries was reference made to any men attending to the butter and cheese making dairy work on the farm, on the family farm. 
dairying was women's work, a tradition passed down from European ancestors. In the 1830s and 40s, Fanny Fuller and her husband Aaron's Fuller Farm in the bars section of Deerfield was credited with introducing cranberry farming to some of the boggy areas of that town. During one early fall berry picking season in the mid 1830s, Fanny Fuller kept an account book for her work and home income and expenses in two separate sections of the small thread bound paper folio. Her account of that season reveals that she was not the only woman who worked in the cranberry farming operation. In her September 30th entry, Fanny lists Miss Andrews and Mary Pomelia who worked on the picking crew, as you can see on this page here that is excerpted uh, from uh, her account book. At the bottom of the page, right in here, um, Fanny notes that she received $4 in payment for 22 bushels of picked cranberries of Harriet Sheldon. That would be about $97 in today's money. Mrs. Sheldon also resided in Deerfield, so it's an example of a neighbor to neighbor transaction. Aaron traveled to the Oneida uh, district of New York and to Boston and wrote letters home to Fanny and their family in which he recounts successful meetings and business dealings. These letters suggest <clears throat> that while <clears throat> Uh, these letters suggest that while Mr. Fuller was on the road 100 or 200 miles from home, uh, Fanny was tending to the affairs of the farm and keeping track in her modest account book. The small size of the manuscript book and the number of entries suggests that the account book may have served for one particular period when, when Aaron was away. Nevertheless, her detailed records show her serious attention to the harvest, the hours and production of the picking crew of women and men, and the purchases of the local clientele. A traditional barrel of cranberries then as now was equal to about a hundred pounds or a little more than three bushels. In 1841, the Northampton Gazette reported that 70 barrels of cranberries were shipped down the Connecticut River from Deerfield and eventually to New Haven. A generation later in October of 1865, the Greenfield Gazette and Courier reported that the Fullers of Deerfield have raised 188 barrels of cranberries this season, which they sold for $15 a barrel, netting the pretty sum of $2,070 or about $28,000 in today's money. The Bars Farm, where Fanny and Aaron Fuller and their children after them raised cranberries in the 19th century is still active today with its complete roadside vegetable stand owned and operated by descendants of the Fullers, although corn has replaced cranberries as the premium crop. One of the most interesting and complex trades involving the provisioning, preparation, and service of food in the Connecticut River Valley is that of the history of women in and tavern keepers. Food and beverages available for purchase during this time make no mention of restaurants. Inns and taverns and later tea rooms were the restaurants of the day. Inns and taverns found success in locating their businesses along trade routes. The Connecticut River was the faster and more important method of trade transport before the introduction of the railway system. And when the river was frozen or running too high or otherwise impassable, uh, this was the trade route of, um, the river was the trade route of choice. But inns and taverns located along the river had a distinct advantage in terms of access to business. In 1832, Chester Crafts purchased a, a large 1785 farmhouse on the main road and trade route to Northampton, or sort of between uh, Hartford, which was uh, the main uh, source of supply, and Northampton in the north part of Springfield, 
that would become Holyoke in 1848. And there operated Crafts Tavern until the 1870s. During the early spring, 15 or 20 members of the Ireland Parish Fish Company would meet at Crafts Tavern to organize for the coming year. Shad and salmon fisheries were a profitable seasonal business that drew eager participation. And as Syl Sylvester Judd recounts in his interviews with fishermen of the time, a man counted himself fortunate who had a share in this business. The traditional connection between taverns and seasonal fisheries was part of the Connecticut Valley Riverine culture. Pop-up inns and taverns opened for the six to eight week season on both sides of the river near Ireland Parish as it was known. So profitable was the tavern business that indeed uh, any part of culture devoted to fishing, whether coastal or inland, finds inns and taverns nearby. The river was the main freight thoroughfare. And when ice closed it to traffic, <clears throat> um, Clifton Johnson uh, wrote back in the 19th century, all the supplies for the county country stores and the little mills up the valley had to go on wheels or runners. Hartford was the chief center of supply and the taverns along the way were kept full every night. During the Crafts Tavern heyday, a woman known only in local history as Aunt Patty was the chief cook at the tavern. And according to one early account, Aunt Patty who presided up at Crafts Tavern was an excellent cook whose coffee and smoking biscuit, which is to say smoked sausage uh, and gravy on biscuits and mince pies were known far and near and the drivers would keep their horses plodding well into the evening to reach this tavern rather than stop at some inferior place. Some women tavern keepers found themselves in this profession due to the death of a husband and either the husband had kept a tavern during his lifetime and the widow chose to continue in this livelihood or she may have had some family history of her own that informed her choice to return to the business. Such was the case for Jerusha Leonard, who kept the tavern license as a widow for 10 years after her husband Noah Dia's death in 1790, until she passed the tavern to her son and daughter-in-law. Molly Emerson returned to her hometown of Westfield with nine children where she purchased and kept a tavern just to survive. Molly's story joins 21 others who were licensed in and tavern keepers in this region between 1750 and 1810. Ann Lanning writes in her study of women tavern keepers of the Connecticut River Valley, most of whom were widows. For those women whose husbands were both alive and the tavern license holder, official records can be misleading about women's work in the tavern or the inn. Whatever name may have appeared on the license, Marla Miller writes, <clears throat> women were, quote, less likely than men to obtain formal licenses in their own names. But it was very often women who kept the engines of taverns running, upholding an unending schedule of provisioning, cooking, cleaning pots and dishes, and laundry, serving and keeping the good order in the taverns that ensured the continuation of the reputation and indeed of the license to operate. So not unlike other generational family businesses, the hard and detailed work of tavern keeping families tended to pass from mothers to daughters. A mother in a tavern keeping family with daughters may well have supervised them to learn the trade from a trusted and responsible parent. Early exposure to tavern work could and did translate to adult livelihoods for numerous women during the 18th and 19th centuries in the Connecticut Valley. The Cook and Clark families, the Pomeroys and Newtons all brought daughters or daughters-in-law into the hospitality business of tavern keeping. And that, uh, that story uh, comes from um, Marla Miller's great uh, book from 2019, uh, Entangled Lives, fabulous read. And no story of Connecticut Valley women tavern keepers is complete uh, without a quick trip north over the border 
into the upper Connecticut Valley town of Charlestown, New Hampshire, where Susanna Johnson Hastings, nay Willard, pictured here, um, <clears throat> returned to New Hampshire in 1757 in the wake of three years captivity in French and Indian Canada. Back in New Hampshire, she wrote her own captivity narrative and opened and kept a tavern in her home for four years after she was widowed in uh, 1759. James L. and Donna Bell Garvin portray Mrs. Johnson in their seminal work on New Hampshire taverns on the road north of Boston as being known and admired in her community for her fortitude, veracity, and character. Although this presentation touches on numerous food trades and businesses open to women of the period, the subject of Connecticut Valley Women Inn and Tavern Keepers has a deep history of recurring family connections and intersections with community life that fascinates and is the subject of my ongoing research. The exposure to and participation in town culture within a professional framework gave women an entree into the workings of trade that home-based agricultural pr uh, production did not afford. Boarding houses were characteristic uh, of small urban landscapes of uh, the Connecticut Valley, such as Springfield and Holyoke, and of course, Hartford, Connecticut, as well as the major cities of Boston and New York, were almost a hybrid of the inn and home production businesses. Social historians estimate that between a third and a half of 19th century urban residents were either boarders themselves or took boarders into their homes. Ruth Graham uh, writes this story in her uh, 2013 Boston Globe article about borders and boarding houses in the growing city of uh, early 19th century Boston. The boarding house uh, provided affordable, centrally located housing in a variety of ethnic neighborhoods and helped to shape American cities and culture. And in doing so, quote, had a lasting influence on the way we live today. Not unlike inns and taverns, boarding houses provided housing for new occupants in search of more permanent housing and for low wage workers, many of whom were immigrants who congregated in ethnic neighborhoods where affordable rooms or apartments were more available and closer to work location. Proprietors of the typical boarding house would be expected to provide some meals in the morning and evening, simple meals that created a sense of family and often boarders would join one another for the evening meal. Additionally, laundry and some cleaning could be provided and some independent boarding houses host, hosted just a single family, whereas some were for larger groups of workers the largest described as being uh, uh, 40 feet long and its longest wall uh, housing 30 people that was in Holyoke. As boarding house proprietors, boarding houses provided an opportunity for women to let out extra rooms in their house, in their homes where they offered family style congregate meals and earned an income um, uh, as the single earner or as support to other working members of the household, where two or more incomes may have been required to make ends meet. And make no mistake, these boarding houses were expected to earn their operators an income. Holyoke's annual city directories uh, of the early, uh, the late uh, 19th and early 20th century provide evidence of boarding houses as early as earning opportunities for women. While larger uh, boarding houses took out display ads in advertising sections at the back of the directory, directories, line by line business listings by category show each business and an increasing trend in boarding houses operated by women between the mid 1880s and the early 1900s. 
by 1890, for example, 18 of the 33 boarding houses listed in that year's directory uh, 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 signified women proprietors. And in 1900, uh, 12 of the 23 boarding houses were operated by women. Rates are not advertised in these particular listings. I have not yet been able to unearth any additional information about what the directories list. However, one woman, uh, Miss Ellen Christian, uh, advertised her dining and boarding rooms, you can see here on the screen, um, in the Holyoke Directory of 1900. Most of the other women's boarding houses were listed in regular font with just their addresses. A great place for additional research for me. In, in Hartford, uh, Sandra L. Wheeler presents a more detailed picture of boarding house culture in her informative study of uh, Hartford's boarding houses and boarding house operators during the same period. Wheeler states that for boarding house operators, income was however not reliable. Food, utility, and miscellaneous expenses could be crippling. She and she concludes that despite scattered instances of prosperity, it seems likely that no one got rich running a boarding house in 1900, end quote. It is clear that to be successful, required physical stamina and an acute business sense, especially for women who could mobilize little assistance from family members, Wheeler writes, converting boarders uh, to lodgers offered less work and probably a more certain income. Uh, lodgers, of course, meaning uh, that no meals would be offered. Food costs would not have had to be added to rent charges, yet it was possible uh, for a fortunate, hardworking few to prosper. The Holyoke Report uh, of History and Present Condition of the Hadley Falls Company, published in 1853, describes other boarding houses, those connected to particular industrial mills in that city where tenement row houses were built as employee housing and rented to those employed by the company. Here's how they are characterized. Quote, convenient boarding houses are erected for the use of the operatives, meaning mill workers. These are owned by the company and rented at comparatively low rates to respectable keepers. Conveniences, <clears throat> excuse me, they are built of brick uh, in the most substantial style and are supplied with all the usual conveniences of modern dwelling houses. Some of these structures are part of Holyoke's downtown mill uh, district today. Although some of the mill businesses they served are long out of business and in some cases torn down. Similar row house boarding houses still stand in the Connecticut River town of uh, Turner's Falls where they provided housing for cutlery uh, factory operatives at John Russell Cutlery Company uh, beginning in 1868, uh, then the largest cutlery company in America, best known for the Jim Bowie knife. It employed 1200 people at its height. Boarding houses then provided not only inexpensive housing but an opportunity for income to the proprietor and to the boarders, some social mixing, a bit of privacy balanced with some amount of intimacy with strangers, some so storytelling and maybe some music. Tea rooms, <clears throat> inns and taverns and tea rooms were precursors of the modern uh, restaurant enjoyed, they enjoyed great popularity in the early 20th century with the beginning of automobile road travel and tourism in New England. Trade routes did not need to be the sole location for dining and drinking establishments. And not unlike boarding house proprietors, women often used unfilled uh, rooms in their house to create space um, to entertain travelers with signage out in front, 
that invited travelers to stop and enjoy some refreshment on their journey. A 1911 article in the Springfield published Good Housekeeping magazine uh, that you see here uh, describes the earning potential and pitfalls of the prospective tea room business opportunities that seem to be sweeping the Northeast as the area of the automobile made Americans more mobile and eager to tour the country's sites and attractions. Tea rooms located on well-traveled tourist routes in college towns and at seaside or mountain resort towns beckoned women with an entrepreneurial spirit. Shore dinners served at coastal tea rooms, fresh milk by the glass in farm country, or just some locally produced preserves on homemade breads and a bit of countryside or riverside scenery uh, brought tourists in the early 20th century whose wanderlust um, uh, brought them uh, to the Connecticut Valley. Abby Wells, you stockade tea room and food shop in Deerfield kept a guest book filled with people's names and cities addresses in 1911. More than uh, 2,200 customers signed and filled 150 pages of that year's guest book, um, showing about two thirds of the guests came from beyond the Connecticut Valley of Massachusetts. Customers from Eastern Massachusetts, upstate New York, and from more than 20 other states, a few Canadian, some English and Irish people signed their addresses to the stockade guest book. Mrs. Wells only kept the tea room for just shy of three years due to a fire that destroyed the business. But Abby Wells' daughter, Mary, known as Molly, and her friend Marguerite Hawks, both the Deerfield, old Deerfield names, Wells and Hawks, later opened one of the most popular of Northampton's 15 tea rooms on Pleasant Street during the first quarter of the 20th century. The two women operated the Mary Marguerite Tea Room and Food Shop, whose menu is shown here with its hot beverages, bouillon, sandwiches, and dessert at the edge of the Smith College campus for more than 30 years, following in the footsteps of Molly's mother, Abby. In the 1930s, when Molly gave a wedding anniversary party for her parents, a guest book provided for the occasion finds that 12 employees listed by name, you can see here in the middle slide uh, on the bottom, um, uh, with those of their tea room employers, Mary and Marguerite, all in attendance at the reception. Sometimes it's just these little things like guest books that show the only evidence of women's employment in the food trades. Very likely these young women, these young women uh, were servers, uh, an entry level restaurant job at a popular tea room to provide a cash income. Mary and Marguerite sold their tea room in 1952, but it continued to operate under the new owners until 1960. The settlement house movement began in England in the 1860s as a response to the dehumanization or the perceived dehumanization of industrialization. The terrible poverty of the average factory worker and the routinization of work as the factory system replaced the individual craftsperson. Various reform movements uh, alive in England during the middle and late 19th century soon crossed the Atlantic. <clears throat> and as in England, eventually flowed into two distinct channels. One was the charity movement, which led to the proliferation of organizations aimed at assuaging uh, the effects of poverty on an individual basis. The other was the settlement house movement, which attended to the needs of the working poor en masse. 
These adopted a more collective and holistic approach, focusing on the community values and organizations. The Skinner Coffee House was of this latter sort and served the community of Holyoke uh, for more than a hundred years. Established in 1902 by uh, Catherine and Belle Skinner, seen here in, in the slide, um, in honor of their late father, William Skinner. The coffee house was originally used by women employed at the William Skinner and Sons Silk Mill for educational, social, and service activities, but grew to become a full service community center by the 1930s. That first 1902 coffee house was a two room space in a first floor walk up. <clears throat> but by 1916, the Skinner sisters had purchased and restored a four story building that accommodated the burgeoning ideals and projects of social change. The main, <clears throat> the new coffee house opened in 1918 just a block away from the first building at the corner of Main and Hamilton Streets, right in the heart of the Mill District, and was a two to three minute walk uh, to lunch from, eat from the mills. Progressive Mount Holyoke College president from 1900 to 1937, Mary Woolley spoke at its dedication, referring to what she called with all due positivity the whole woman making scheme. It embodies, she said, the physical ideal in its cafeteria and public bath, the education and recreation ideal in its classes, lectures and entertainments, in music and dramatic performances, dancing and games, and the home ideal by instruction in dressmaking and millinery and domestic science, and particularly by mother's meetings with practical talks by doctors and nurses and not the less practical widening of the horizon by glimpses of other peoples and lands. The coffee house started out as a way for factory women who worked in Holyoke's textile and paper mills to have an affordable and convenient lunch. In the first years, the cost of a sandwich and a cup of coffee was five cents. And right here, you can see there's something posted on the side of the, of the uh, beverage dispenser. And we were able to blow that up to find the menu of the day with its offerings and, um, uh, and prices. And we also found in the archives, uh, uh, some of the accounting, uh, uh, some of the financial records for the Skinner Coffee House. Here are two pages of simple statements of accounts. And what is interesting right here at the bottom of these accounts um, is that we see 10 women's names who were employed five at the coffee house itself, perhaps some of the women whom we saw uh, on the, the previous uh, slide, preparing food during uh, lunchtime service. But we also notice another five women's names on the payroll who taught classes uh, in English language uh, to those for whom English was a, a second language, arts and crafts, and sewing classes, which were always full. There were volunteers, uh, volunteer opportunities uh, for women to cook and serve meals to seniors and cooking classes, domestic science classes as Mary Woolley and the culture of the day referred to them, often attended by young single or newly married young women or mothers, perhaps learning modern cookery for the first time. So not only was the Skinner Coffee House a benefit to the community of women who worked in Holyoke's Mill District for affordable and convenient lunches, it was also an, uh, an employment opportunity for other women to teach their neighbors valuable life skills. And their payment for this teaching work included cooking classes, 
uh, is noted here. Uh, that included uh, cooking classes is noted here in the financial statements for the coffee house. Anniversary guest books for special occasions at the coffee house document the brief but telling accounts of generations of women whose daughters and granddaughters grew up together in this supportive community setting. By the time cooking classes were underway at the Skinner Coffee House, domestic and professional education in the domestic sciences had been established in Boston for more than 20 years. The Boston Cooking School founded in 1879 by the Women's Education Association um, uh, of, of Boston uh, to quote, offer instruction in cooking uh, to those whose wished, who wished to earn their livelihoods as cooks or who would make practical use of such information in their families. One of the Boston Cooking School's early principals, Fanny Merritt Farmer, was invited to stay as assistant principal immediately upon her own graduation in 1877. Within two years, she became its principal and achieved widespread fame with the 1896 publication of the Boston Cooking School cookbook the book we know as the Fanny Farmer cookbook. In the Connecticut Valley, um, we, had our, we had our own domestic science uh, publication. Uh, Holyoke's Good Housekeeping uh, magazine published its first issue in 1875 and opened the doors of the Good Housekeeping Research Institute in Springfield in 1900, followed by its New England cooking school. The, the uh, Good Housekeeping Department of Cookery conducted classes, recipe and product testing, producing lectures for daily radio broadcast, as well as articles for the editorial pages of its magazine issues. In 1902, more than 100 pupils were in attendance, as, as this uh, clip uh, shows. You can see uh, a unique feature of the the work of the New England Cooking School of the Good Housekeeping Institute during this its second year is the demand for lessons by mail, verbatim reports of Miss Downing's lecture. Uh, that was uh, Helen H. Downing, who was a famous teacher there. Um, and the demonstrations are made and reproduced <clears throat> for the benefit of young women at a distance of whom there are a considerable number that are learning in this way. There are a hundred pupils or more, and the enthusiasm quite matches that of last year, which was very marked. Isabel uh, Gordon Curtis uh, served as Good Housekeeping's editor from 1900 to 1903, and went on to produce three books of Good Housekeeping, uh, three cookbooks for Good Housekeeping, whose recipe collections were guaranteed to have been tested uh, not just by the recipe's author, but by the magazine subscribers and the Institute of New England, uh, the Institute's New England School of Cookery. In 1903, while working as editor at Good Housekeeping, she compiled the Good Housekeeping Everyday Cookbook, a combined memorandum cookbook and scrapbook, which was uh, reissued in 1909 under the title, The Good Housekeeping Woman's Home Cookbook. So here it is, Isabel Gordon Curtis's best-selling Woman's Home Cookbook published under the new 1909 title. After Good Housekeeping, she went on to work in uh, cookery editorial work at Collier, uh, The Delineator and Success Magazines. In 1909, Curtis also published her own cookbook, Mrs. Curtis's cookbook, bound together with the 700 page reference work by Sidney Morse, Household Discoveries. Not content with her cookery books, Gordon also wrote and published novels, three in the last years of her life. 
the Connecticut Valley south of the Massachusetts border in Hartford, Connecticut, claims America's first published cookbook, American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. And uh, a later 1798 edition was published in Hartford for Simeon Butler in Northampton. Although very little is known about the woman who signed her cookbook uh, with the tagline, An American Orphan, her pioneering work in book publishing was no small feat for a woman in 6, 1796. Her references to cookies and pearl ash for leavening, the forerunner of modern, modern baking powder, were new to cookery manuals of the day. Simmons' American cookery included recipes for new world foods such as corn, cranberries, turkey, squash, and potatoes, all indigenous to the Americas. As such, it is an indispensable reference uh, of great interest for anyone uh, uh, interested in American historical cooking. Moving into the upper Connecticut Valley, just um, the upper valley, meaning uh, North, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont line, uh, just for balance, uh, Another woman uh, worth remembering for her work in food writing, editing, and publishing is Sarah Josepha Buell Hale. Um, she was uh, married but widowed at the age of 34 and struggled to support herself and her five children. After a failed attempt uh, to start a millinery business, she resumed writing uh, as she had done uh, in her earlier years. Uh, her conclusion was that, um, she said, uh, very few employments in which females can engage with any hope of profit, my own constitution and pursuits made literature appear my best resource. She moved to Boston uh, at the invitation of the Reverend John Loris Blake, an Episcopal uh, a minister and headmaster of the Cornhill School for young ladies who offered her the editorship of a new magazine devoted to women, the Ladies Magazine and Literary Gazette, which uh, was changed in 1834 to the American Ladies Magazine. At American Ladies, she accepted only original material and solicited work from American women contributors. She printed articles that she thought would improve her readers. She created a regular section with the heading Employment for Women, beginning in 1852, to discuss women in the workforce. In 18, excuse me, in 1837, she moved to Philadelphia to become the longtime editor of Godey Ladies Book, which under her editorship dramatically increased its circulation uh, by tenfold. During her tenure at Godey's, she raised money for various historic preservation projects, including George Washington's Mount Vernon home and the Bunker Hill Monument. She remained its editor until the magazine was sold in 1877 and died in 1879 at the age of 90. The Connecticut Valley is host to numerous library collections that are that have some element of um, culinary history uh, connection. The Macintosh Cookery Collection uh, is an 800 item collection at the Robert S. Cox a Special Collections and Research Center at the Amherst campus of the University of Massachusetts and includes books pamphlets and ephemera relating to the history of cookery in New England, uh, nearly 7,500 of which are cookbooks prepared by community organizations from the 1880s to the present, usually for fundraising or charitable purposes. These cookbooks uh, document the important aspects of the lives of families and women in the region, uh, as well as ethnic groups and their adaptation of traditional foods to New England. While the collection is focused primarily on New England, it also includes cookbooks
from other states for comparative purposes. Rob Cox's own monograph, uh, one of several food-related titles he published during his lifetime, gave me some great insights about the culture of cranberries um, in New England, and it is an excellent read. It's the history of cranberries culture in New England. Sophia Smith, the Sophia Smith uh, Women's History Collection at Smith College Libraries, as well as the Mortimer Rare Book Room are both important and unique collections filled with culinary gems and great historical research and reference facilities for women's historians. The library has recently reopened after an extended limitation to its use to college and community only due to COVID-19, but I, this past week they reopened uh, by appointment. And my home library at Historic Deerfield, uh, the Memorial Libraries of Historic Deerfield and the Pocomtuck Valley Memorial Association, um, it has an important collection, uh, uh, has several important collections uh, of <clears throat> manuscript account books, um, uh, and manuscript cookbooks, and maps particularly. And of course, its close association with uh, two museums of early Connecticut Valley life make it an ideal research facility and just a good place to spend the day. My thanks to the librarians there for their invaluable assistance with this research. And although the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe College in Cambridge is not in the Connecticut Valley per se, it does house the papers of two important culinary figures with historical ties to this valley. Julia Child, uh, a 1934 history graduate of Smith College and a uh, rock star of the culinary world, and anthropologist, author, and food historian Sophie D. Coe, who graduated in 1955 from Radcliffe and earned her PhD from Harvard in 1964, both in anthropology. The Sophie Coe Prize in Culinary History is given annually at the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery. Sophie and her husband, the historian Michael Coe, uh, adopted Heath, Massachusetts in the hills of Franklin County as their home uh, in 1869 where she lived until her death in 1994. The Schlesinger Library also features one of the most important collections of historical cookbooks and manuscripts in the world with 20,000 volumes dating from the 16th to the 21st centuries. All of these libraries uh, have excellent digital access, of course, as do many other great cookbook and culinary collections in New England and across the countries of the world too numerous to name here, but the Connecticut Valley and Mass but Connecticut Valley and Massachusetts have definitely a surfeit of riches in culinary history, if that is your interest or obsession. As is often the case with a look into history, we can gain insights into the modern world based upon the efforts, uh, sacrifices, and problem solving of those who came before us. During this period and up through the 20th century, most women in the United States did not work outside the home. And those who did were primarily young and unmarried. Even in the early 20th century, just 20% of all women were gainful workers as the Census Bureau uh, categorized labor force participation outside the home. And only 5% of those married were defined as such as was repeated uh, by uh, Janet Yellen. Throughout the period, Connecticut Valley women were entrepreneurs employed in family businesses, sometimes in businesses that established and carried the passage of knowledge and tradition over the course of several generations. They navigated the same challenges as other labor uh, <clears throat> affected uh, by a changing landscape of trade, uh, transportation, education, time management, and cultural pressures. And not just domestic goddesses whose piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity boxed them into the cult of true uh, womanhood. 
ever, the economist Yellen noted that the major strides women have made in the labor market by their entry into paid work has been a major factor in America's prosperity over the past century and a quarter. And I think the rest of the notes that I have here are definitely repeats of what I have said before. So thank you very much. And I hope this was um, fun for you. Um, it was fun for me to uh, find stories of these women um, in the Connecticut Valley. And I will be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Elise. That was so interesting. I had no idea there was so much culinary history in our own backyard here in like this part of the New England. I mean, how fantastic. And um, we do have the chat open for questions. Um, we do have one that says um, from Donnelly Obertali, who is uh, one of our new uh, Wisteria House Foundation board members. She asks, are there any cookbooks in the Wisteria Hearst archives or recipes used by any of the Skinner family, which normally I know Penny would jump on, but Elise, you are very familiar with our collection. <laughs> yes, so um, there are a number of manuscript, there aren't cookbooks per se, although one is being worked on that will include uh, recipes, manuscript recipes from uh, both the Skinner family themselves and, for, and from people who worked for the Skinners. One of whom, and I think I may have, oh, I don't know if I can actually get it. One of whom was a, a woman of color named Ada Peoples, um, uh, who, who's uh, Charlotte Roos Mold was recently donated, gifted to uh, uh, Wisteria Hearst uh, by uh, a Skinner family descendant. Uh, so we look forward to seeing those, uh, seeing those recipes in, in an upcoming book um, that, well, you know. Yeah, well, and I we have, have the have cookbook. Some interest in. <laughs> yeah, we have the cookbook that um, the Skinner family actually contributed to the church cookbook and- The church cookbook, um, right, right, right. Yeah, so you, you did a was, recipe um, of that. So that was uh, the congregational, the second congregational church uh, in Holyoke. Um, Mrs. Skinner, the elder Mrs. Skinner, um, wife of William, the, the silk magnate of Holyoke, contributed a, both a Thanksgiving cake and a Christmas pudding uh, to, uh, to that cookbook. And we have um, included that in the, in the cookbook, yes. Yeah. And, and anyone is welcome to come to our archives and see this cookbook in person. They're welcome to see what else we might have. We, we love having people come to visit our archives. And this is, um, we have very limited time, but I, I thought I would ask, because you do hearth cooking demonstrations and hearth cooking is traditionally a, a woman's role, um, are there any hearth cooking demonstrators who are male or is it just women. Oh, no, it, it, it's, uh, I think we are 50-50, if I'm not mistaken, really? they're, they're at, at Deerfield, yeah. Um, and uh, certainly uh, there are um, cookbooks from the, the 17th and 18th centuries uh, written by men. And one of our hearth cooks has a particular interest in, um, in uh, uh, replicating some of those uh, men's recipes from uh, particularly England of, mm -hmm. uh, of the, that period. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there any other questions that we have? I know we've gone really long on time. And if there's anyone on the phone who has a question, because we have a few people near by phone, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Otherwise, we've been getting lots of thank yous and, you know, this <laughs> very informative. And I mean, I just want to reiterate those sentiments. I mean, this was really, really interesting. So with no more questions, I will just thank everyone. Oh, wait, we have one. Um, let me see. From Mary Ann, 
I'm curious to know which woman was from Sunderland, which I believe was mentioned in the advertising. Thanks for an interesting talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. What, like who was the woman from Sunderland? Is oh, that? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not say Jerusha Leonard? Jerusha Leonard. Okay, great. The woman who whose uh, work I did not uh, include in this talk, who might have been me uh, mentioned in the um, the advertising, was um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Lucretia Hall, whose uh, tavern has been moved from Charlemont, where it was originally and is now the visitor's center at uh, Historic Deerfield. Uh, that tavern is, and its kitchen, is where the hearth cooking demonstrations and classes for Historic Deerfield are conducted. Um, and they, uh, they will happen every Saturday uh, and some long weekends uh, throughout uh, the, the spring, summer, and fall. The museum is due to open in April and it will go through November and every weekend there, uh, there will be hearth cooking there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elise. And we are gonna part ways with everybody else in the room, but I wanna say thank you again for everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions or if you wanna come to the museum, please feel free to uh, email us. We can get you in and uh, thank you again for coming. Have thank a great you. night. Thank you. Thank you.